Hanwell Asylum, Wikipedia Audio The County Asylum at Hanwell, also known as Hanwell Insane Asylum, and Hanwell Pauper and Lunatic Asylum, was built for the pauper insane. Hanwell was the first purpose-built public asylum in England and Wales, and it opened in 1831. Some of the original buildings are now part of the headquarters for the West London Mental Health Trust. Its first superintendent, Dr. William Charles Ellis, was known in his lifetime for his pioneering work and his adherence to his great principle of therapeutic employment. Skeptical contemporaries were amazed that such therapy speeded recovery at Hanwell. This greatly pleased the visiting justices of the peace as it reduced the long-term cost of keeping each patient. Under the third superintendent John Connolly the institution became famous as the first large asylum to dispense with all mechanical restraints. The asylum is next to the village of Hanwell but parochially belongs to the suburb of Southall. It is about 8 miles or 13 kilometres west of central London and 6 miles southeast of Uxbridge. Early History The building lies on a gently sloping river gravel terrace, a common feature of the Thames Valley. The land immediately to the east was further eroded by the River Brent, which flows along its eastern perimeter. At its southern boundary is the Grand Union Canal and a flight of six locks. Both the southern wall of the old asylum and the flight of locks have been designated a scheduled ancient monument. Today the on-site facilities have been reduced from what was once the world's largest asylum, although it is still used for treatment of and research into serious mental distress. A prior trust created the London West Mental Health R&D Consortium which also has its administrative base there. There is now a complex of other buildings known as Ealing Hospital NHS Trust built on the old asylum's recreational grounds and cycle track to the east. At the back of the main building are some disused wards that still belong to the regional health authority. Adelaide now divided into one male and one female ward but with a shared garden and activity rooms and taking admissions from the Ashford and Staines area of West London, Ellis now divided into three wards Ellis and Brent serving the area of the London Borough of Ealing, and Campion serving the area of Southall. In addition an occupational therapy OT centre was provided. Bungalow wards are one six named after rivers such as Clyde and Avon and taking admissions from Acton, Shepherd's Bush, Buckinghamshire, and Berkshire. In the remains of the former O Block buildings there were also facilities for art therapy, music therapy and, until a patient with a complaint against religion burned it down, a small chapel. Several Acts of Parliament allowed the building of the asylum, and statutes have driven the subsequent changes in mental health care. The background to the creation of the asylum included the 1808 County Asylums Act which was passed after an expensive war against France. This recognized lunatics as being ill, as being held in the wrong institutions and perhaps having a chance to recover if given the right type of treatment. Non-recovery would mean that the insane pauper would always need to be looked after, which would cost more in the long run. Some parishes were growing in population due to industrialization, and the existing charitable institutions and workhouses could not cope with the increasing demand. The recognition of insanity as an illness can almost be seen as a cost-saving measure rather than a humane one. Whereas the practice of confining such lunatics and other insane persons as are chargeable to their respective parishes and jails, houses of correction, poor houses, and houses of industry, is highly dangerous and inconvenient. The 1808 Act was passed to empower county justices of the peace to construct asylums financed out of the local rates, which proved very unpopular. 
As JPS faced annual re-election, they often met resistance to this policy. The cost of keeping lunatics in jails and workhouses had previously been charged to their parish of birth, and continued indefinitely as there was no attempt to cure them. To make matters worse, the Corn Laws kept food prices high while the Enclosure Act of 1813 removed the right of poor people to use the common lands to support themselves, causing added mental distress to the already impoverished. Concern grew about the disproportionate number of lunatics in Middlesex. The local judiciary decided on November 15, 1827 to exercise their powers and build an asylum. In the following year Parliament recognised the barriers to asylum building and passed the 1,828 Metropolitan Commissioners in Lunacy Act to ensure the 1,808 Acts was enforced. It gave JPS the powers to progress things more rapidly. Work on the new asylum at Hanwell started in 1829. Most of the land 44 acres was purchased from the Earl of Jersey. The building contractor was William Cubitt, who completed the work to a tight budget of £64,000. W.C. the architect was William Alderson. His neoclassical design consisted of a central octagonal panopticon tower with a basement and two other floors. The windows are tall with semicircular bonded gauge brick arches at the top. There were two wings of one basement and just one other floor in the form of a west-east corridor. Both wings turn north, and each terminates at its own panopticon tower, which again has a basement and two floors. The overall building forms three sides of a square. The east side of the central tower was intended for the male patients and the west for the females. With germ theory beginning to be developed around this time, spreading the wards out in this manner was thought to help reduce the spread of infections. To provide modern psychiatric facilities for the people of Ealing, to empty the west side bungalow wards allowing almost half the former asylum site to be sold and converted into a housing estate which would in turn pay for the building of this wing and pay for additional unspecified health building projects in northwest London. Four million UK pounds was a figure being mentioned at the time for the sale but this must be considered as unsubstantiated gossip rather than fact. The design also reduced the need to build corridors and saved money. The wards themselves were long and thin with a corridor from one part of the asylum to another running through the ward itself. From the air the design is roughly symmetrical with services, kitchens, laundry, management, chapel and hall all located in the middle with wards laid out to each side, male to the left of the entrance and female to the right. As Hanwell was the first purpose-built asylum in England and Wales, this became one of the two standard design plans for county asylums and was copied and modified by the designers of countless other asylums across England and Wales, Clayberry, or Springfield. The main alternative design being the villa plan. The one item that Hanwell did not possess was a gymnasium, in later designs this was often built under a first-floor hall. Hanwell's Hall is said to have had a ward beneath although this area has been offices for many years. Beverly Ward, Acton, Ellis Ward, Ealing, Greenford and Nordholt, Brent Ward, West Ealing and Hanwell, Campion Ward, Southall, Devon Occupational Therapy Centre. 1808 County Asylums Act The central tower was adorned with a monumental clock procured from John Moore and Sons of 38 9 Clerkenwell Close, London. This was later moved to the chapel tower when the chapel was built. In November 1829 building work started again on the first extension, 
and there were further expansions in 1837, 1857 and 1879. The extensions which were added in 1857-59 are readily identifiable, as they have flat bonded arches to the tops of the windows. The building was designed as a functional workspace and home for the treatment of insane paupers, rather than a residence or civic building. This unfortunately led to poor ventilation, and together with overcrowding may be the reason behind the high rates of tuberculosis before the age of antibiotics. This was made worse when the basements were converted into sleeping dormitories and even a few extra wards by excavating earth away from the basement walls and fitting windows. This worked quite well for much of the east side where the ground level is almost 5 meters lower than on the west due to the slope. The main view most people see of the hospital is the elegantly proportioned gatehouse entrance which adjoins the Uxbridge Road. It takes the form of a neoclassical half-circular arch, large and solid over tall vertical barred, iron gates, which incorporate a small pedestrian gate with its own key lock. The harsh architecturally solid lines are softened somewhat by the vine creepers that envelop the upper parts. Surprisingly, it is built from pale grey galt bricks which are not only gauged but had to be expensively brought in. On the north side of the building there is a Blue Ordnance Survey benchmark. This point was measured to be 69.279 feet above mean sea level. The asylum opened on May 16, 1831 under the administration of the local committee of visiting justices of Middlesex County Council. Upon opening it admitted 24 male patients and 18 female patients. The first superintendent was Dr. William Charles Ellis. His wife Mildred Ellis, held the post of matron, from the opening in 1831 until William Ellis' resignation in 1838. It was found essential for recovery that the patients should get out into full daylight for fresh air and exercise, so the ground floor wards had airing courts which were shared by the other wards upstairs. These were pleasantly laid out areas with seating and bounded by walls or railings. Some patients, well into their recovery, were allowed to walk and work in the surrounding fields. The asylum had its own carpentry, bakery and brewery along with many other services and was as self-sufficient as possible. The asylum paid the canal company for taking water from the canal and had its own dock to receive barges. This was very convenient for receiving coal deliveries, which was used not only for heating but for producing gas for lighting. Decision to Build Asylum The building Originally planned to house 450 patients, with space for a further 150, its capacity was reduced back to 300, with space for another 150. This was due to fears of an outcry if the local tax rate increased too sharply. At first the number of paupers admitted was low due to the charge of 9 shilling per week each, this being higher than the workhouses and jails, but by force of the law the asylum was full within six months and more space was badly needed. In November of the same year, work on building extensions began to address this problem, and so started the almost continuous process of rebuilding and improvements that go on in the present day. Bethlehem Royal Hospital Museum, London Metropolitan Archives, Wellcome Trust, Gunnersbury Park Museum 1831-1889 The Middlesex County Asylum, Hanwell Dr. William Ellis and Mildred Ellis Anatomy Act John Connolly The friends or relatives of a deceased patient were free to remove the remains for burial. 
Failing this, the deceased were interred in unmarked paupers' graves in the hospital's burial ground. With the 1832 Anatomy Act, the body was first kept in a building called the Dead House, on the west side of the burial ground. If unclaimed after 72 hours it could be sold to a licensed anatomy school. The Act also provided for the donation of bodies. As autopsies on paupers did not require the coroner's permission, autopsies became common at the hospital. From 1845 the results of these autopsies were recorded in detail by Dr. Hitchman. John Connolly took up residence as the third superintendent on June 1, 1839. In April 1839, Sergeant at Law John Adams, one of the visiting justices of the asylum and a founding member and first chairman of Legal and General, suggested that Connolly visit the Lincoln Asylum and see the system operated by Robert Gardner Hill. He was so impressed by this that he decided to abolish mechanical restraints at Hanwell. This must have taken enormous powers of persuasion, the existing staff would have to change their work practices and learn how to nurse more effectively those patients with troubling behavior. However, the reform seemed to avoid the patient suffering further trauma as a result of restraint and being made to feel completely helpless. Connolly succeeded in introducing the reform by September 21, 1839, less than three months after he took charge. This is perhaps a testament to the earlier work of Ellis. The Illustrated London News Something of Connolly's success can be gauged from this extract from the first page of the 68th report of the Visiting Justices. The Visiting Justices have the satisfaction to find that every year, as the excellence of the non-restraint system becomes more generally recognized, affords fewer materials in the asylum for comment or report. For four years it has been the settled rule of the House, that no harshness nor coercive cruelty should be used in any case, but that every patient, however violent, should be treated with uniform kindness and forbearance, and during that time such has been the undeviating success of this plan, such has been the even tenor of it course that it now presents no new fact nor features either to vindicate or explain. This is the more extraordinary, as it rarely happens that a theory can be brought into practice without losing a portion of its presumed efficiency. Connolly described the therapy in his book The Treatment of the Insane Without Mechanical Restraints. A full-page illustration and short article was published in the Illustrated London News on January 15, 1848 about how Twelfth Night was celebrated at the Hanwell Asylum. In 1888, the earlier 1879 Act of Parliament to facilitate the control and care of habitual drunkards was made permanent. As Hanwell would take in such patients for up to a year, this act was seen as a reason to close the brewery M. However the patient's pub the Bee's Knees continued to sell alcoholic beverages until the mid-1990s. With the term London County being introduced for the Greater London Area, the asylum was renamed the London County Asylum in 1889. The brewery closes. On June 11, 1910, Nurse Hilda Elizabeth Woolsey followed a female patient who climbed one of the fire escapes and then along the guttering of the ward roof. She held on to the patient until help arrived and they could both be lowered to the safety of the ground. For this act of heroism she was awarded the Albert Medal which was exchanged for a more suitable George Cross in 1971. Under the administration of the London County Council, the asylum was renamed the County Mental Hospital, Hanwell. 1889-1937 
Taken in the first half of the 1920s this image shows that the nurse's home has still to be built in the top right corner of the frame. It has since been demolished. Further to the top right is the railway iron bridge at the junction of Uxbridge Road and Windmill Lane which runs south to the left of the frame. Running down the left-hand side is a section of the flight of locks on the Grand Union Canal. By the 1920s there were sufficient beds to ensure that no person too ill to keep within the laws of the land need be sent to jail. Local prison population subsequently fell. The London County Asylum, Hanwell London County Mental Hospital Hanwell Mental Hospital the hospital was under the administration of the London County Council until 1948 when responsibility was transferred to the new National Health Service Northwest Metropolitan Regional Hospital Board, which was reorganized to become the Northwest Thames Regional Health Authority with local power invested in the Ealing District Health Authority in 1974. One ward of the hospital was used as the local emergency medical services center, to treat war casualties during the Second World War. Several bombs landed on the hospital and its grounds during the war. It was close to two strategic targets, the AEC factory in Windmill Lane which built fighting vehicles, and the Warncliffe Viaduct which carried the Great Western Railway a vital transport route. Some of the UXBs fell into the soft sediment of the River Brent, and some may still be there. However a V1 hit the hospital laundry and caused many casualties. This event is mentioned in a personal account by Simon Tobit in WW2 People's War. The gatehouse also received some bomb damage. Following the Second World War, new medicines were found to be effective in the treatment of many of the major mental illnesses, see chlorpromazine. Following refinement and clinic trials they were introduced at the end of the 1950s and made a massive positive impact on the hospital. At last there was an effective treatment, and as a result the containment aspect of segregated patients within wards could for most wards be relaxed. As their illnesses responded to treatment patients recovered and started to be discharged. In the early 1960s the hospital reached its maximum size but now started for the first time to discharge more patients than it admitted. Later the main and secondary gates were unlocked during the day removing forced segregation from the outside world and in 1975, the eastern wall was removed to make way for a new general hospital to be built in the asylum grounds. At an unknown time in the 1960s or 70s the ward numbering scheme was replaced, the earlier system was a letter defining the sex followed by a number, F23 the 23rd female ward for instance or M4 a male ward. The new system consisted of giving each block a letter of the alphabet and then attaching a number to it, D2 or E1, each block containing between 1 and 8 wards depending on location. It is presumed that the naming system attempted to reduce the perceived size of the hospital to visitors and new patients being admitted to say the 23rd female ward gave the impression of an awful lot of female patients, compared to being admitted to say K2 ward. Later these designations allowed for names to be used using that first letter D2 the middle floor ward of D block, the fourth block from the left became Dean ward with, whilst E1 became Elgar with E2 Elliot, and E3 Emerson on the top floor. Away from the main asylum buildings, on spare ground on the west side of the hospital seven bungalow wards and other therapy buildings built for World War I shell shock victims. These were given the block designation O, but despite being the newest buildings, within 20 years most of these wards had been demolished. 
In the 1980s the remaining buildings had external walls and roofs made from corrugated material, iron, or perhaps asbestos with rudimentary wooden interiors. Perhaps they were designed to be quickly erected and used for a short time. During the 1930s the Adelaide and Ellis groups were built. In the photograph above, the top left corner may show foundations for the Ellis Ward group. It is believed that these wards also found work caring for the shell shock victims of World War II. The wards each featured a large covered patio area facing south and looking onto lawns and shrubbery beds allowing patients to sit and relax whatever the weather, sun, or rain. During the 1940s a further set of six bungalow wards were also built to care for more shell shock victims. They were built in a similar diagonal pattern to the earlier bungalow wards but further west and were given the designations R16. After the creation of the NHS all of these newer wards, Adelaide, Ellis and the R bungalow wards being away from the main asylum buildings formed a suite of wards that looked after new mentally ill patients with the aim of assessment treatment and discharge home or if too ill transfer into the older asylum wards where longer term care was given. A snapshot in the 1980s would show. Dr. Max Meyer Glatt, was one of the pioneers in the treatment of people with an addictive personality trait. Appointed as a consultant in 1958 he set up an alcohol dependency unit in a female ward. His approach of creating a therapeutic community with a 12-week inpatient stay to help patents come to terms with their problems and explore new methods of living in the future without their addiction was found to be a great success. In 1982 this was moved and became a drug and alcohol dependence unit in B Block and although the 12-week inpatient stay was reduced to 10 then 8, and then 6 weeks. This moved again in 2000 and is now known as the Max Glatt Unit and situated in A Block. It is currently run by the Central North West London Mental Health NHS Trust, Substance Misuses Service. When the unit was originally located in the top floor of F Block patients often used to complain that they could smell beer and think that they were going mad. Little did they know that the Bees Knees pub was in located nearby in the basement below G Block, they really could smell the beer. Between 1975 to 1984 the hospital pioneered a massive rehabilitation program assisting patients whose mental illness was being well controlled to regain life skills lost through many years of being looked after in a large institution institutionalization. Whilst almost all of the long-stay patients had been able to leave the grounds of the hospital for some years few actually saw the need to do so, this seemed wrong as with the control of symptoms offered by modern medicine few now actually care in a hospital setting. The plan was simple teach each patient how to cope with life outside and slowly reintegrate them back into society placing small groups of friends together in houses in their former home area. Practical skills such as cooking, clothes washing, and shopping had to be learned or relearned and life skills such as relationships and resolving conflict within the group taught. Some required skills in crossing roads or using buses, others had health problems that they needed to learn to manage. Small trial group homes were created within the hospital to allow each group of friends to learn to manage and nurses assisted patients to go shopping for food or clothes or to the cinema building confidence and skills. Halfway houses were also created independent living but still just inside the hospital two in the gatehouse on the Uxbridge Road. Patients moved through several stages of living together from large groups with 24-hour staff to forming their own small group and living alone but with a staff member popping in twice a day before moving out completely to live in a house together. Many staff moved from being hospital-based to community-based and spent their days visiting and supporting groups of patients with their problems. 
Some patients formed relationships and wanted to live together as a couple sharing a bed and bedroom. Several former patient groups had no local community that they considered home but instead expressed a wish to live in the countryside or by the sea, all were accommodated with the knowledge and support of local social and nursing teams. Between 1975 to 1987 nearly 1,700 long-stay patients were discharged from the hospital, some frail and elderly to nursing homes but most living in their community. In the mid-1970s a UK government trial was announced to try to reduce the stigma of psychiatric hospitals, at Hanwell the a new district general hospital was built in the grounds of the former asylum, the whole site then being named Ealing Hospital and comprising two wings, the general wing and for the psychiatric hospital Ealing Hospital, St. Bernard's Wing. The wing being larger both in physical size and in patient beds than the main hospital. In fact St. Bernard's with over 3,000 beds was more than six times the size than the 470-bed General Hospital. Meanwhile, in Worcester a new psychiatric unit was built at Newtown Road next to Worcester's main hospital at Ronxwood, Worcester, and replacing the acute and elderly wards of the area's former asylum, Powick Hospital. See main article The Ealing Hospital for further details. Ealing Hospital website the management of both hospitals remained totally independent with each medical unit reporting directly to the Ealing District Health Authority and not to any board called Ealing Hospital. However one physical site allowed cost savings with some of the facilities shared, St. Bernard's oil burning boilers for instance were enlarged in number from 4 to 6 to provide hot water and radiator heating to both hospitals and the existing laundry facilities on the St. Bernard's site, near the boilers, provided bed linen and towels to both hospitals. But the new Ealing Hospital building included a larger mortuary allowing the outdated St. Bernard's mortuary to close. Both hospitals retained separate kitchens, maintenance, pharmacy, telephone exchange, and portering services whilst separate management required separate finance, human resources, and later IT departments. However, the new nomenclature given to describe the general hospital built in the grounds of the former asylum was found to go against all natural intuition and so forced people to keep resorting to the name St. Bernard's Hospital or just St. Bernard's to make it clear that they were referring to the psychiatric parts rather than the general hospital which was called Ealing Hospital or Ealing General by the public. Even by 2006 the old name was often used in internal communications and in-house publications and some national service websites still give the address as Street. Bernard's Hospital this approach has proven an effective coping mechanism against the Petronius syndrome. Likewise, its geographical attachment depends on context. For postal communications it is in Southall, in the county of Middlesex for non-clinical administration it is referred to as the Ealing site and to the people to whom it serves it remains in Hanwell, West London W7. Run by the Forensic Directorate, this unit was named after Isambard Kingdom Brunel S3 Bridges that lies only a few hundred feet away to the west. One of the wards was named after the Rastafarian dub poet and mental health campaigner Benjamin Zephaniah. The Three Bridges RSU was originally built on the asylum burial ground a rectangular area that was walled in by high walls on all four sides except for a gate for the mortuary at the west end. A build within these four walls made a good case for the unit's location, but a subsequent extension removed much of these walls. The unit, initially three wards, was further extended in 1992. 
In 1987 the existing Ward 1 of Ealing Hospital, built as an infectious disease isolation unit was reopened as the first NHS hospice in the country, all earlier hospices being charities. With this came an important role for its NHS consultant doctors to lead the treatment of palliative care in the UK. Ward 1 was renamed Meadow House Hospice. In 1993 the hospice was a part of the general nursing community services that formed roughly half of West London Healthcare Trust. However, in 1999 service management was again reformed and this hospice together with other non-psychiatric services parted company. See, Meadow House Hospice website for further details. In 1988, the local district health authority, following government edict to close the smaller cottage hospitals and maternity units, and bring health services together on one multidisciplinary site, opened a new maternity unit in a car park next to the Ealing Hospital, this had the striking feature of a bright blue roof. In 1992 the Ealing District General Hospital gained trust status, a UK government term that gave the management greater financial powers and was renamed Ealing Hospital NHS Trust. St. Bernard's had to create a new different identity for itself and regained the name of St. Bernard's Hospital once more. Payments for services provided by each separate entity such as hot water and heating now became financial contracts between the two organizations. Changes to psychiatric healthcare between 1982 and 1990 and in particular new medications, saw the reduction of patients being cared for in long-stay wards and instead moving from institutionalization to assisted self-care. Hundreds of patients were supported as they gained or often regained knowledge of how to care for themselves before leaving the hospital to move perhaps into a house with three or four other patient friends initially within, and later discharged to a house outside the hospital. Many of St. Bernard's medical, nursing and paramedical staff moved from hospital-based work to community support as a result and towards the end the hospital was able to close wards quite dramatically. Changes to UK health service structure and the creation of trust hospitals also caused many changes to St. Bernard's. As a large asylum the hospital treated patients from all over the west side of London and out into the counties of Buckinghamshire, Berkshire and Surrey in addition to its original intended catchment of Middlesex, and between 1990 and 1995 many of these patients had their care transferred back home to newly built local facilities and St. Bernard's lost catchments such as Shepherd's Bush and Ashford the hospital reduced in size as a result. As the hospital was almost always full from the 1940s onwards, the number of beds is an accurate way of defining the number of patients, and in 40 years the hospital shrank by 90%. However the staff in the 1990s had expertise in secure services and the hospital gained a regionally funded region secure forensic medicine service that was the catalyst for a move into providing the regional and national specialist psychiatric services that are offered today. The John Connolly Wing was built on the asylum playing fields, removing the opportunities for patients and staff to play football or cricket. A two-story building, it was designed as two east and west halves under another blue roof, a color matching exactly that of the maternity unit. A hanging corridor was built from the first floor into the general hospital entrance, but with the general hospital gaining trust status and general hospital patients not keen on having psychiatric patients in the shop areas of the general hospital. This corridor was closed off and is now only used for fire evacuation reasons which admittedly was always its primary design purpose. The aim of building this wing was twofold. 
On opening three wards and their occupational therapy center transferred across from the west side bungalow wards to the west side of the John Connolly wing together with one ward from within the main asylum building. In line with the then current thinking the new wards had far fewer beds, each new ward had 15 beds and single rooms, replacing wards that all had in excess of 22 beds each in mostly shared single-sex dormitories of 2, 4, 6 and 8 beds. Progress in a way, but some psychiatric illnesses cause a withdrawal from the company of others and it could be argued that single rooms do not help. The old west side wards were demolished immediately. 1938-1950 Three elderly assessment wards also opened on the east side of the John Connolly wing and as they were created from several different wards, were given new identity names from the Lake District of England. A new occupational therapy centre for elderly care was also opened. The Ealing Hospital NHS Trust's formation in 1992 had comprised only the General Hospital and Maternity Services, and prompted by the UK government the management of St. Bernard's Hospital and the management of the General Community Health Services in Ealing, the joined together to form a second NHS Trust. In 1998, St. Bernard's main building underwent a major refurbishment. It cost in excess of four and a half million pounds and took roughly eight months. The growth of high-quality regional forensic services and the freedom of trust status allowed for an expansion of services and a specialization into purely psychiatric care. In 1998 it was agreed that the existing psychiatric services in Hammersmith, Chiswick, Twickenham, Ashford and Fulham be combined into a new trust organisation with its headquarters at Hanwell whilst the general non-psychiatric community services and services for people with learning difficulties slash disabilities also became part of new trust organisations. St Bernard's Hospital a new management strategy was created in October 2000 with the name West London Mental Health NHS Trust as the new organisation with an assortment of new and refurnished buildings and built on a foundation of quality of care, gained contracts to provide psychiatric services to most of West London. In 2001 and Tony Hillis Wing was opened named after Tony Hillis who was formerly the Deputy Director of Nursing at St. Bernard's and remembered for being a great supporter of patient involvement and being non-judgmental towards those he cared for. During the Second World War In 2006, the Wells Unit was opened. A medium secure unit it was designed to accommodate up to 10 adolescents between the ages of 12 to 18 years. In 2007, the Orchard Centre was opened, as a medium-secure psychiatric unit for women. The Department of Health had conducted a consultation and found that women experiencing mental health problems were poorly catered for. This led to new guidelines being drawn up and published. Part of this guidance called for women who suffer mental problems, and for whom only medium secure accommodation was needed, to be treated in way that was sympathetic with their gender. The WLMHT found itself in an almost unique position in both location, facilities and experience, together with a close working relationship with the London West Mental Health R&D Consortium. All this enabled it to construct a successful business case for a medium secure women only unit to be built on this St. Bernard's site. To meet this end, the design details and layout of the unit has been thoroughly researched to provide those features which are hoped will aid recovery to sustainable health. This work was undertaken by Tuke Manton Architects LLP of Clapham. This was undertaken in partnership with Keir Group PLC who were chosen by the West London Mental Health Trust to be the building contractors. 
1950-1990 The Post-War, New Treatments Era The development of the new site as a whole required some of the existing Grade II structure of the hospital to be demolished. This was allowed on the account that these parts were not of significant architectural or historical interest to justify preserving. However, the south boundary wall had to undergo some renovation work to make it sound again. The old artesian well was considered an important Victorian artifact and was left intact. This required the foundations of the new unit to be built a little further to the south than originally intended. The hospital buildings have been used on many occasions as a film or television location due to the proximity to several TV and film studios, Victorian prison-like architecture, lots of external nooks and crannies and during the 1980s and 1990s plenty of empty ward space. Closed down wards became film locations as nightclubs, hairdressers and free French army barracks. The ITV 1970s TV series The Professionals filmed both outside and inside for several different episodes, most notably in one episode when a car is driven at speed towards the asylum main entrance followed by both main characters running down the white spiral staircase of the central tower into the basement below. At least one other episode uses a ward as a location where the three main characters visit a person supposedly in a general hospital ward. Numbering System New 20th Century Buildings Dr. Max Glatt Institutionalization and Rehabilitation of Long-Stay Patients The Ealing Hospital, St. Bernard's Wing 1979-1988 Three Bridges Regional Secure Unit opened 1985 New General Hospital Buildings 1991 Present St. Bernard's Hospital 1992 Closure and Sale of Half the Asylum and Grounds John Connolly Wing opened 1992 Acute Adult Psychiatric Service Acute Elderly Psychiatric Assessment Service West London Healthcare Trust Asylum Refurbishment 1998 Ealing, Hammersmith and Fulham Mental Health Trust the BBC 1970s TV series Porridge starring Ronnie Barker used the outside courtyard of the buildings near the old pharmacy for outside shots of the prison in several episodes, the pharmacy windows had vertical bars on them, resembling a prison. Some scenes of the 1989 Batman film starring Jack Nicholson as the Joker, were also filmed in empty wards at Hanwell. This went down especially well with the staff as an earlier film of Jack's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, set in an American psychiatric hospital, was at that time a favorite. Some scenes of Stephen Polyakov's film She's Been Away were filmed at the hospital. Dame Peggy Ashcroft starred as Lillian Huckle, a woman who was institutionalized 60 years before whilst still a young girl simply because she did not conform to social norms. In the 1963 film The Bargee, and starring Harry H. Corbett, Ronnie Barker, Hugh Griffith, and Eric Sykes, the two barges descend the flight of locks with the hospital in the background. The hospital could be seen in the background as Adam Hart Davis explained how the locks and side ponds of the Hanwell fight of locks operated. My eye caught an omnibus on which was written Hanwell. Men deny hell, but not, as yet, Hanwell. G. K. Chesterton, in Orthodoxy was inspired to ask, who really should be considered mad? West London Mental Health NHS Trust It is also referenced in Lord Dunsany's story, 
the coronation of Mr. Thomas Shap. And in the Big Four by Agatha Christie, Chapter 2, The Man from the Asylum. Hanwell is also mentioned in H. P. Lovecraft's 1924 short story The Rats in the Walls, in which an American-born scion of a cursed English house is interred there after discovering the horrible truth of his family's past. Hanwell Insane Asylum was mentioned in George Bernard Shaw's 1914 play Pygmalion. Phonetics professor Henry Higgins, after successfully telling strangers where they were born by their accent, was jokingly told he came from Hanwell Insane Asylum. Tony Hillis Wing 2001 Reverend H. A. Norris realized in the early 1980s that there were old records at hospital which were historically important and should join the others in the Greater London Council Records Library. He feared these would be thrown out by staff, and volunteers formed the museum committee to help. They recovered much of the hospital heritage. This also included mechanical restraints, ECT machines, and some of the old fixtures and fittings. The largest item by far was the last original seclusion room with white stained leather covered straw padding walls and floor, this was recovered from June Ward in J Block. One of the books retrieved in the search by the museum committee was a discharge book. The first entry was within a few months of the asylum's opening and recorded the death of a young woman, it listed her reason for admission as being continually sneezing. The Wells Adolescent Unit 2006 Also on display was a letter written by Arthur O'Connor. He had been committed to Hanwell on May 6, 1875 for firing an unloaded pistol at Queen Victoria earlier on February 29. The purpose of writing was to petition for his release, which was granted on November 16, 1876. He never came to the attention of the authorities again. The collection has now been dispersed to, and can be seen at the Orchard Center 2007 W.C., he was no relation to the other famous builder Sir William Cubitt, who lived in the same era. On a housing estate which was built during the mid-1990s on part of the original hospital grounds, the name Cubitt Square was given to one of the residential areas, M., although the sedatives peraldehyde and chloral hydrate were known about they were not used in medicine. It was not until about the 1800s when people like Emile Crepeline studied them, that their medical usefulness was considered. Of course, these were too dangerous to replace the traditional sedative whilst patients consumed alcohol daily. So this may have been the window for the adoption of synthetic concoctions and potions as palliatives. Br. The bricks are thought to be Smead Dean Belgrave yellow stocks from Kent. The low iron and higher lime content of the mud there gives the characteristic yellow hue to the bricks. C. The commuting of staff is a relativity recent phenomenon in the history of St. Bernard's. Before, they would have been able to live in good, clean, and habitable accommodation situated on site. Also, the normal working day back then was 12 hours long with little in the way of street lighting, so the proximity of these facilities was of great benefit. This was provided as a free and a much valued perk with which to attract people of the right caliber. Coordinates, 51 degree 3023 and 0 degree 2106 W 51.50644 degrees north 0 0.35160 degrees west 51.50644, 0 0.35160. In popular culture, film and television, in literature or prose, Theater Museum 
notes.